Hello folks, happy Sunday and welcome to my roundup of this week's car news. Now 80% of you watching this are not subscribed, so please hit subscribe, please hit the notification bell and give the video a thumbs up and then we'll get started. Done it? Good! Official Ford Bronco 4x4 coming to Europe in 2023. The Bronco's a very cool looking beast of a car. Look at that. Wowza. It's been confirmed for a European launch at the end of 2023. The Bronco's been a massive hit in the US since it was kind of relaunched over there. Uh, so far, the off-road has not officially been sold in Europe, but Ford has now confirmed plans to bring it across the Atlantic in limited numbers at the end of 2023. Unfortunately, it will only be sold in left-hand drive European markets, so a UK allocation is not currently on the cards. Autocar understands that limited sales projections in the UK, Australia and Japan make production of a right-hand drive variant unviable. As you might expect, there's already a grey import market out there for the Ford Bronco. Bronco is currently available to order in the UK through London-based importer Clive Sutton, priced at £45,000 to £85,000 with a choice of 2.3 litre or 2.7 litre EcoBoost petrol engines. It's only going to be the full-size Bronco coming to Europe, by the way, not the Bronco Sport. New MG4 takes on Volkswagen ID3 with 280 mile range. So we touched on this in last week's video, but it's now been announced that it's coming out in September and it's going to have up to 281 miles of range. Be sold with a choice of 167 brake horsepower and 201 brake horsepower single motor rear wheel drive powertrains from launch, while a 443 brake horsepower dual motor four wheel drive range topper is set to follow. No mention of cost there, but previous it suggested it's going to be around about 28 grand, but they haven't mentioned it at all in that article. By the way, I should have mentioned before, but these stories so far come from Autocar, if you hadn't guessed. Suzuki Jimny tipped to return as five-door hybrid 4x4. An extended five-door Jimny prototype could be the first indication of the off-roader's electrified comeback. This is great news. The Jimny is a brilliant little car. When it was relaunched, they only sold them for a couple of years. It's then available as a commercial vehicle only, just with two seats. And it looks like they're giving it a bit of a stretch and chucking a couple of extra seats back in the back. The compact 4x4 was pulled from sales in Europe 2020 due to the adverse effect it was having on Suzuki's fleet average CO2 emissions, although it remained on sale in other markets. It's expected that Jimny Hybrid would use a powertrain similar to that offered in the Suzuki Vitara. Options to include 127 brake horsepower, 1.4 litre turbo petrol mild hybrid and 113 brake horsepower, 1.5 litre full hybrid. Aside from being more compliant with a cleaner powertrain, the Jimny could also be made more competitive in adopting a pair of rear doors. Again, no details on price, but thoughts are that the car will be just over 20 grand. Uh, but interesting news that one. Under the skin, the useful future for tired EV batteries. Reports suggest that second life battery capacity could exceed 200 gigawatt hours globally by 2030. So this is a really interesting article. This is what they can do with batteries once they've sort of come to the end of their life in a car. Companies are working hard to build a high speed charging network that's anywhere near as plentiful, accessible and reliable as the refueling station network, which has taken 100 years to evolve, but they've got a huge task ahead of them. Providing enough public sites with enough charges to support a growing number of battery electric vehicles on UK roads is one thing, but local supply must also keep up. And as they say here, installing brand new charges at a site doesn't necessarily mean there's a brand new local area distribution network to go with it. Second life batteries which have reached the end of their useful lives for powering BEVs could make a huge difference. The question of where urban users with no off-road parking can charge conveniently remains a challenge too. So basically they're talking about making these sort of mini local charging hubs that are going to be powered by car batteries that are no longer in use and, um, and all renewable energy. So they'll have huge solar canopies over the top. You'll be able to book your slot with an app on your phone, drive up to it, charge your car, take it out again when it's done. And they're citing this as a potential solution to A, what do we do with all the old batteries and B, what do we do for people who can't charge on their driveway? There would obviously have to be quite a lot of these. I don't know if this is a perfect solution. Um, I don't know the reality of putting this in place, how many of them they can put in place. But it seems like an interesting idea and um, I guess we'll see how it plays out.
Volkswagen plans to overtake Tesla by mid-decade. CEO Herbert Dice says VW will aim to take advantage of Tesla's battery supply issues and COVID shutdowns. He said basically that the German firm could overtake uh, electric car giant Tesla to become the world's largest manufacturer of EVs by 2025. He says Elon Musk simultaneously ramped up two highly complex factories in Texas and Berlin and expanded production in Shanghai. That will cost him strength. We have to seize this opportunity and catch up quickly by 2025. We can be in the lead. Musk has suggested that Tesla's new factories in the US and Germany were losing billions of dollars because of combination of issues at shipping ports in China and battery shortages. Both the Berlin and Austin factories are gigantic money furnaces right now, Musk told Tesla owners of Silicon Valley back in May. It's really like a giant roaring sound, which is the sound of money on fire. I bet the investors loved hearing that. Tesla factories in China have also been severely impacted by COVID-related shutdowns. The past two years have been an absolute nightmare of supply chain interruptions, one thing after another, and we're not out of it yet, Musk said. How do we keep factories open so we can pay people and not go bankrupt? <coughs> Volkswagen, meanwhile, is expecting a much stronger end to 2022, with DICE claiming that it's earning more than ever. Volkswagen's targeting production volume of around 800,000 EVs this year, with the goal of producing 1.2 million in 2023, following an extensive overhaul of its facilities. Let's hope it sorts out a decent infotainment system while it's doing so. By the way, folks, I just want to really say a big thank you to all the folks at Westbourne Fire Station who hosted my family and a couple of others the other weekend gave us a demonstration of the aerial ladder platform and showed us around the fire station. It was a really, really great time. They actually got a shout when we were there, but luckily it wasn't a serious one, so they were back quite quickly. But it was really good. The kids absolutely loved it, and it's great to go and sit behind the wheel and play fireman for a minute. Big thanks to Gareth, Amanda, my good friend Mark, and Will, and anyone else we saw on the day that I've missed out. Thanks a lot. Right, we're now over on Auto Express. Secret Volkswagen Phaeton successor finally unveiled. It's been six years since the Phaeton went off sale. Now VW reveals it had plans to keep going in the luxury saloon market. VW was actually remarkably close to announcing a second generation Phaeton. These new images show a working, running prototype that looks pretty much ready for production. Not only that, the Mark II Phaeton, dubbed Phaeton D2, showcased plenty of VW's tech that eventually found its way into other production cars. That's quite interesting. Obviously, they didn't go ahead with it in the end. You sort of wonder why, really. The Phaeton was a brilliant car, and it was a, a real rival to things like the S-Class, the 7 Series, the A8. And, uh, yeah, wonder why they didn't go ahead with it. New 2022 Volkswagen Amarok pickup arrives with V6 power. The new Amarok returns with a new look, more tech, and a premium finish. So there's a big launch for this this week, and it looks rather nice. Um, this looks quite familiar as well, doesn't it? If you've ever seen a Tesla or a Polestar or a Volvo. The engine range kicks off with 148 brake horsepower, 2 litre diesel. Then there's a 168 brake horsepower version of that unit. And a twin turbo diesel with either 201 horsepower or 206 horsepower. At the top of the range is a 3 litre V6 TDI that has either 238 or 247 brake horsepower, depending on the market. VW will also offer a 298 brake horsepower 2.3 TSI four-cylinder petrol for certain markets. And that 2.3 is a rebranded version of the Ford engine that you'll find in things like the Mustang and the Focus ST, Focus RS. Uh, no mention of pricing or which ones will be sold in the UK just yet. Seven-seat Hyundai Ioniq 7 to arrive in 2024. The imposing Ioniq 7 SUV will be Hyundai's largest all-electric vehicle. So Hyundai just recently announced the Ioniq 6, and they've said the Ioniq 7 will be coming in 2024. So it seems likely that we'll see some sort of firm details on this middle of next year, possibly. Once again, these cars are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. It sounds like it's going to be bigger in every dimension than, than the um, Hyundai Santa Fe, which is already a very large car. Due to new battery technology that Hyundai are developing, which will basically increase how much energy they can fit into a battery, it could have a range of around 400 miles, which for a big seven-seat SUV is probably not a bad shout because it's going to be used for, you would think, long journeys, big family holidays and all that kind of jazz. No other information in that really. All electric Alfa Romeo Giulia will come with a 500 mile range. Alfa Romeo Giulia will ditch combustion engines for EV power by 2027. 
So 500 mile range. This is the interesting thing that's happening at the moment. You've got cars that are now get, starting to be announced and starting to appear with much higher range. And you have to wonder what that's going to do to used prices of cars with, say, a 200 mile range, 250 mile range, 150 mile range. When rivals are coming to the market now, we're like four, 500 miles of range. Really not a great deal more information in that article. So I shall move swiftly on. Supply shortages shackle new car market performance. This is from SMMT and they basically compile all the official stats for the UK motor industry. New UK car registrations fell 24.3% in June, according to the latest figures released today by the Society of Motor Manufacturers and Traders, the SMMT. This month saw just under 141,000 new vehicles registered, the weakest June performance since 1996. Battery electric vehicles continued their growth streak, however, with a 14.6% increase in volume and market share continued to grow, reaching 16%, up from 10.7% a year before. Conversely, plug-in hybrid uptake fell by 4,425 units to take a 5.5% market share. In total, plug-in vehicles comprised more than the fifth of new cars joining the road in the month. All other powertrains saw declines in registration volumes. So that's quite interesting. It suggests there really that some of the plug-in hybrid owners are now moving to full battery electric cars. You see there's a massive decline in diesels, 46.7%. Mild hybrid diesels have dropped. Uh, petrols have dropped significantly. Mild hybrid petrols have dropped. This is the year-to-date change, by the way. You see hybrids are well up at 26% up. Uh, battery electric are 56% up. And then diesels 50% down mild hybrid diesel 40 percent down petrols 20 percent down but everything really seems to be moving in one direction at the moment which is more uptake of battery electric and hybrid cars which is no great surprise labor pledges to create 30,000 jobs at electric car battery gigafactories party makes the promise amid reports that the uk is falling behind european rivals in production capacity for evs i don't know how labor can promise to do that when they're not in government i know we haven't really got much of a government right now at the time I'm making this, but um, it's not Labour, is it? So it'd be interesting to see how they're going to do that. But this is a big thing we touched on before is the fact that the UK is not producing enough battery power plants means that more and more sort of car manufacturers are taking their business elsewhere where they can get everything on tap. So it certainly seems like a good idea to be investing in these giga plants. Not only do they create jobs and income for the for the country, they then support the vehicle manufacturing industry, which again produces job, jobs and income for the country. That one's from The Guardian, by the way, as is this. Doctors to overhaul car wreck rescue techniques amid new evidence. Firefighters trained in movement minimization since 1980s, but method can be time consuming and cost lives. So what they're saying is so many people die in car accidents here and everyone's trained to keep people as still as possible because, you know, one millimeter of movement in the wrong direction, if someone's got a spinal injury, could mean they spend the rest of their lives paralyzed. What they're actually saying is because that's so time consuming, so they basically have to disassemble the car around someone, there's they're thinking about more encouragement to get people to get themselves out of the car because if they have if they've got other injuries and they spend half an hour or 45 minutes cutting them out of a car those other injuries could have taken their toll and you know lead to complications that could end their life it was discovered that trapped patients were almost twice as likely to die as those who were rapidly freed from the wreckage and it also said that spinal injuries among such patients was in fact extremely low just 0.7 percent and in half of these cases they had other serious injuries needing urgent medical attention our absolute focus on movement minimization works for maybe 0.3 percent of patients but it extends the entrapment time for 99.7 percent of them potentially hundreds of people have died as a result of extended entrapment times and if you multiply that worldwide it's many many people this is a chap called dr tim nutbeam by the way who's an emergency medicine consultant and the lead for Devon Air Ambulance. So that's really interesting that and great to see that, you know, research is going into improving things because when I'm researching these news videos this week, if I put in UK car news into Google and click on news, if the 30 stories come up, 20 of them will be someone died in a car accident here, someone died in a car accident there. It's all the time, it's every day. 
and uh, anything that can be done to reduce the numbers of deaths on the road is great. On that somber note, folks, I'm going to say thanks very much for watching. Please give the video a thumbs up and please consider buying me a coffee. I'm absolutely scratching a living at the moment. So anything you can do to help me keep producing this content for you uh, is much, much appreciated. Thanks again for watching. See you next time.